Good evening, Lexington Church of God family. Once again, glad to be with you. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue our study of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7 is where we'll be tonight. Uh, I want to, again, let you know this Sunday, 9 a.m. Uh, in the sanctuary or 1030, preaching in the parking lot. Uh, I want to I wanna encourage you to be there. God has put something special on my heart, particularly for those that have been through a difficult time, difficult season in your life. Uh, or, or just anything dealing especially with, uh, with grief or difficulty in your life. God has put a special word on my heart uh, for this Sunday. So make sure you're here for that. Tune in either way. Uh, also want to remind you, Pastor Appreciation is coming up not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. Uh, there'll be more information uh, about that to come. Um, so anyway, be aware of those couple of things. want to just take us to the Lord in prayer tonight as we get ready to get into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you again, Lord, for this glorious day, for this wonderful opportunity, Lord, to, to fellowship, to break open the bread of life, the Word. I pray tonight that your Holy Spirit, God, would come to us tonight, Lord, wherever we are in our homes, Lord, in the church, God, in our cars, Lord, wherever we're at. Lord, as we're tuning into this, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would impart unto us knowledge, wisdom, revelation, understanding, and discernment, Lord, of your Scripture. As we confess tonight, Lord, that these come through you and you alone, Lord. They're not found in a man. As your servant, I humbly acknowledge that, Lord, and I confess that I'm nothing, Lord. God, you and you alone are God, and I, I present myself simply as a tool in your hand, God, an instrument for you to use however you see fit for your glory. Therefore, let it be your word that goes forth tonight, not the word of a man. And I pray that you and you alone are seen and glorified in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, again, Revelation chapter 7, you can find the questions uh, on the Church of God website, the Lexington Church of God website. Uh, I, I want to encourage you again each week, read ahead. Uh, read ahead, study. You, you can read through the whole book if you want, but each week, uh, read the chapter that we're going to be covering. Ask God to... to give you a special revelation as you read it, but you'll come in much more prepared. You will get so much more out of it if you will just read ahead and have the word already familiar in your heart uh, and questions that you may have. So Revelation chapter 7, of course, we know the writer of the book of Revelation is John as he was banished to the island Patmos. God gave him this divine revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Revelation 7, beginning with verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, the wind that, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Manassas, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Simeon, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Levi, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Issachar, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Zebulon, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Joseph, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Benjamin, were sealed 12,000. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all the nations and Kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are those which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, which have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore 
are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want us to look at this scene. Uh, and before we do, I want to just uh, briefly... Take us back. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time there, but chapter 6, if, if you weren't here the previous weeks, go back and watch those videos, tune in there. But chapter 6 probably one of the most uh, important or, or pivotal chapters in this entire book. Uh, it, it deals with the first six seals and introduces the seventh seal. We know that the things that we are reading about in chapter 7 here, it says, and after these things, after which things? After these first six seals, after these six, before we get to the opening of the seventh seal, before we uh, hear the sound of the seven trumpets, we, we, we pause for a minute in between the six seals and the opening of the seventh, and John sees this after these things he, he sees. So now let's get into this. And So describe the scene. Here's our, our first question for tonight. Describe the scene and the significance of verse 1 through 3. Verse 1 through 3 says, After these things, again, after the six seals have been opened, before the seventh seal is now open. Before the, the trumpets and the bowls are revealed. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel descending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So when we look at some. What does John see? He says, After he saw the sixth seal being opened up, after these things he saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the winds so that they would not blow upon the earth. So these four angels were holding back the, the winds. The, these are going to be winds of destruction, devastation, if you will, really the wrath of God. So John sees four angels standing there, symbolically representing the four corners of the earth. So a, a worldwide devastation. And we can see even um, from verse 2, the second part, it says, I saw the second angel ascending from heaven, having the seal of God, and he cried with a loud voice. Notice this. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So we know the four angels that John saw holding back the, the winds of God. It, it was given them the authority to, to loose the judgments upon the earth, to, 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 to let go of these uh, uh, um, the, the winds, if you will. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth so that they would not blow upon the earth until, until it was ready. But, but they were given permission to hurt the earth and the sea. And yet, here's what John sees. I see these four holding back the winds. And as I see them, I see another angel approaching. And I hear him crying out to these, don't loose the winds yet. Don't let them go yet until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And so here's what we, we see here. Uh, we see that destruction is coming it, it's not only coming, but it's already appointed. We, we see them holding back the winds. In this final moment here, uh, we see the angel of God crying out, don't release it until we've sealed the servants of our God on their head. So we've been talking a little bit about the tribulation. You know, in what, what moment is the great tribulation? The birth pains, again, if we liken it to what Jesus said, there are many birth pains leading up to the moment uh, uh, of that great tribulation, the actual birthing moment where there's a ripping and a tearing and there is greater agony and pain in the moment of the birth than there has been leading up to it. There's been a lot of discomfort, maybe even some other birth pains that were very intense and all of this, but there comes a moment at the birth 
of great tribulation. So we look back and, and we need to understand that there will be a season of tribulation leading up. There will be wars and rumors of wars and all these things that Jesus talked about. They'll intensify. They will increase. Uh, but there will be this moment just before he comes, before the birth, if you will, where things will be great, this great tribulation. So we don't know exactly at what moment you know, we will enter into that great tribulation. But we do know here at, at this point when we're reading into Revelation 7 that uh, the, the last chapter has certainly ushered us in. If we were not there already, we've certainly ushered us into the great tribulation period, that that moment right at the birthing, right at the second coming, if you will. It will intensify with pain like we've never seen. The world will go through tribulation like they have never gone through before and never will again. That ripping, that tearing, that great agony just preceding the birth moment. So we see these four angels stretched out, ready at any moment to release the winds upon the earth. And the angel crying out, don't do it until we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Now, uh, there's something here that I think we need to, to look at. So it says, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. What's significant about the forehead? The forehead is probably the most obvious, the most visible area of your body. When you walk up and you approach someone and you're talking to them, you're looking at their face. That's one of the first things that you notice. We know from the uh, 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 armor of God that the helmet of salvation, it covers the head. Uh, so till we mark them in the most obvious, and, and I don't know that this will be some literal mark Although some suggest that it will, I'm not so sure that it will be a literal mark. It's the seal of God. God's marked them with his seal. Uh, and, and their life will be obvious. It will be obvious to the world. It will be obvious to all who see them that there is something about them, that they are marked by God, separated uh, unto God for a sacred work. Um, we know that they are sealed uh, by God, meaning that they are separated unto God. They, are, they have a special calling from God, if you will. So I want to look at just a couple of things. In Revelation chapter 6, uh, verse 9 through 11, we saw uh, these martyrs. This was the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of them, this Revelation 6, verse 9, on the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them which dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So we saw there even at the fifth seal that there would be more martyrs. How long before you'll avenge our blood? And basically, God says, hold off just a little while. There's more that have to die. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that because I want you to see that these that we find here in Revelation 7, these 144, these are marked by God for a special uh, hedge of protection, if you will. It's not that they won't go through tribulation. They will indeed go through tribulation, and yet through it, they will be protected. Uh, I think we also can find a biblical um, basis for this type of protection. We see uh, that same protection in Noah and his family, that they went through the tribulation. They went through the flood, right? They went through it, and yet they were protected. God had separated them, Noah and his family. Well, we don't only find that there. We, we find that with the children of Israel. When the plagues came down upon Egypt, they went through all these plagues, and yet God protected them through them, especially the one with blood. So there was a, there was a mark in, in, in that case. There was a mark, yet it was on the doorpost. You remember that? And, and when the death angel, God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. So they, they went through that tribulation, and yet God preserved them and protected them through 
portions of it. They were exempt, if you will. We see that even in Rahab, the, the harlot, who, who, who helped the, the 12, uh, or helped the spies, uh, you know, when they were coming to attack Jericho. When those walls fell, God protected her, her family through that. So we, we see here that God can do this. So now I took you back to the fifth seal, and we see the martyrs there. How they they had died already, and this 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 may be before that great tribulation. Uh, it, it may include martyrs, you know, including even Stephen. How long, God, will you not judge the earth? How long will you let this go on? Uh, and then we see these hundred and forty four thousand here that are marked off. Now, these will be protected. Revelation 9, I'm skipping ahead just a little bit. In the book of Revelation chapter 9, we see this in verse 4. It was commanded that, that this, is, this is dealing with, I'm not going to read all of that, but this is dealing with some of the judgment that, that we'll be reading about in the upcoming chapters. It was commanded for some of this judgment that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men, look at this, only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So we can see even, even when the uh, great tribulation gets poured out that this, this group that John sees here, uh, he says, I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to those four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. In other words, don't pour out this wrath until we've sealed the, the, this, this group of people for God's protection. They will go through tribulation, and yet God will protect them through that. God will seal them off and separate them from it. They will have a special hedge of protection around about them. I hope that makes sense. Um, when God sealed them on their forehead, this visible, noticeable, again, there will be something obvious about their life. It symbolizes God's protection. It symbolizes God's ownership. Uh, it symbolizes, much like the blood did, that, that, that they... They will be separate and distinct and that they will go through and yet not be harmed by all of this. So I say that because it still has to be pretty frightening to go through. Um, it still has to be very uh, intense upon them, this going through this great tribulation. But they've been marked off and preserved. Now, one of the things that I want you to see again, these are sealed on their forehead, the seal of God. On their forehead, meaning that they are separated. They are separated and not just from the world. They are separated to God for a special purpose. Now, this is key here, I believe, in the interpretation. This, this would mean that these, these have some special purpose, right? Some special calling from the Lord. In Revelation 14, skipping ahead, it, it describes these as these are the ones who were not defiled with woman, for they are virgins. Uh, I, I'm not going to get allow myself to get too far ahead in, in dealing with this, but I, I want you to see uh, for sure that these are sealed by God. It means they're separated from the world and they are separated to God. That would imply no, no doubt in my mind, some special anointing, some special calling, some special purpose for the sealing. Amen? Uh, and, and if we look at Revelation 14, and it talks about these being, you know, men who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, um, some have suggested this is not literal, this is all symbolic, and, and maybe it is. Again, I could be wrong. Um, there are many interpretations, and, and you'll find throughout this, I, I don't have any desire to play the part of God and tell you definitively that, that I know specifically what these things mean. So I'd rather give you some, some ideas out there, but uh, there's some that suggest that, you know, this is uh, symbolic of the church who has not spiritually defiled itself by 
uh, by playing the part of the harlot or committing adultery, for they are virgins. Um, but I'm not sure that, that um, I, I go along with that. Maybe it is. I don't know. But, uh, but if we're trying to overly spirit, spiritualize this, we simply may be reading too much into it. And I know that some think, yeah, but, you know, they, they don't necessarily have to be virgin. But we're talking about just a select group in the world that God has marked off for a special purpose. Now, let's think about the time that we're in. We're, we're certainly in this great tribulation period now when, uh, when if I can use this, this term, if there's ever been a time that would fall under this descriptive category, hell on earth, if there's ever such a time, it will be this great tribulation period where I, I'm not so sure that, you know, marriage and families and raising children will be one of the top priorities of life in that moment. These are men that have been uh, marked by God for some separate purpose, and I believe a distinct calling, if you will just bear with me here. Uh, if they have been called to this special purpose at such a time as this, a family will just bog them down. And, and if God has really separated them, then it's not really such a great stretch to think that they've been called to celibacy for such a time as this, that quite literally they may be running through the earth uh, and, and preaching the gospel. And not really being consumed with, with 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 fleshly desires. I mean, if you think about, you know, let me let me just paint some sort of picture in your mind. And I know that you know many of you may be thinking, yeah, but you know, life goes on, or they may have needs and this, that, the other. Can you imagine an earthquake, you know, going on, or 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 a fire, you know, wildfire, you know you know, just roaring through your neighborhood and it's not quite made it to your house yet. Are you going to be thinking about, you know, well, I need to be planning the wedding. You know, are you going to be thinking about your sexual desires? And probably not. In a moment like that, you're going to be so consumed in the devastation just outside the door that these thoughts aren't on the top of your list right now of things to think about. So in the Great Tribulation, you're going to see things like that and yet they don't stop. It's constantly at the door. It's probably not going to be the priority of many people's minds at that point. So I don't think that it's so far uh, out there to think that these may very well be, be literal virgins who God has called. Again, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I'm not willing to die on that hill. But I believe with all of my heart that, that these who are sealed uh, with the mark of God on their forehead through this great tribulation are men on a mission. These are men on a divine assignment. Now, let, let, me just, let me just say this. If God can take 12 spirit-filled Jews and turn the world upside down, if he can take 12 men called by Jesus, fill them with the Spirit, and, and, and turn the world upside down, think of what he can do during this great tribulation period with 144,000 who are going about preaching preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ during such agony. This is what I think these people are or they represent. Um, so let's move on. So what John sees there again, just to recap, he sees these four angels holding back the wrath of God to fall upon the whole earth. As he's seen them just holding back the wrath of God, he sees another angel come rushing onto the scene crying with a loud voice, don't pour it out yet. Don't release the winds yet until we've sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. That's what John sees. So how many were sealed? I've already kind of answered that. It was difficult for me to, to not. Um, but our second question for tonight, how many were sealed and who are they? Verse 4 through 8. Well, here's the number, 144,000. Here's where we get it for, from. Verse 4 it says, and I heard the number of them which were sealed. Listen, he says, I heard the number. He doesn't necessarily say I saw them or saw their faces here. I heard the number of them which were sealed. And they that were sealed... 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes, listen to this, of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali 
were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Ishkar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Let me deal with a few things here just in a uh, vein of teaching. Many suggest that uh, that these 144,000 who come, as the Scripture tells us, these were of the tribes of Israel. Uh, some suggest that this is the spiritual tribe of Israel, meaning that it could include Gentiles and uh, even you and I. I don't believe that. I believe that this is literal. Uh, there's, there's no other place where God uses the 12, 12 tribes to, to symbolically represent, you know, just the church. He, he specifically calls these out. Um, and, and we'll get into this more in just a minute. We'll see a multitude, not counting the, this 144,000 as well. So I believe that this is indeed uh, um, children of Israel. Now, uh, one of the things that I also want to cover here, dealing with the 12 tribes, because there's, there's some discussion here on why particularly Dan is not included in the list of tribes, and there's some theories, and, and so I'm going to give you just a little teaching dialogue on that. First, let's Let's cover the, the tribes of Israel, who they were. Um, we know that, uh, um, that Jacob, Jacob who became Israel, uh, Jacob had two wives, Leah, uh, his, his first wife, and Rachel, his second wife. Um, he wanted to be married to Rachel, and his father-in-law deceived him, and the woman that he married, he thought was Rachel, but it turned out to be Leah, uh, and so uh, Jacob's father-in-law tricked him into working, you know, some more years working for Rachel, and so you have to go back and read that whole story, but uh, here's why we have these different tribes. So Leah, his first wife, gave him six sons, Reuben, his firstborn, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, uh, Ishkar, and Zebulon, those six all would go on to, to represent a tribe in Israel. Um, Leah also had um, a handmaiden, or, or uh, yeah, handmaiden is a good word for it, Zilpha, who he also had two sons with, um, Gad and Asher. Both of them go on to represent uh, 12 of the tribes. And then he would have his second wife, the, you know, the one that he really loved, Rachel. Uh, and Rachel gave him two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, the, the 12 tribes of Israel doesn't really include Joseph, but instead the uh, the, the tribes of Israel would represent two of Joseph's sons. So it's interesting that, you know, um, Benjamin would be represented as one of the 12 tribes, but Joseph wouldn't. Instead, uh, two of the 12 tribes would be Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, and then Rachel had a handmaiden as well named Bilhah, who also gave him two sons, Dan and Naphtali. So now, here's the thing. If we, if we include just the 12 sons, then it, you would have all the 12 tribes covered. But Joseph doesn't represent a tribe. Instead, he has two sons who represent tribes. And so really, you end up with 13. And so that's a whole different thing. And, and uh, but I'm just making a point here. When we get to this, there's a lot of speculation. Well, why isn't Dan mentioned in the tribes? I don't really know the answer. There's, there's a couple of theories. One, uh, one is that maybe it's because Dan was one of the first tribes to enter into idolatry, and so therefore it's excluded. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that is the case. But the reason I gave you that list tonight to kind of look at is that they're really not the only one that would be left out. Uh, if you go through this list, you'll find that Ephraim is also not mentioned. Instead, Ephraim is substituted for Joseph. And I don't want this to sound too confusing again, but, you know, and that's fine if we, if we bring Joseph in, but then we don't need to list Manasseh because Manasseh was one of the sons of Joseph. 
So we list one of the sons of Joseph, and we don't list the other. So I don't know exactly why that is. One of the other reasons that, that it, it's thought of that, um, you know, that maybe Manasseh wasn't, uh, you know, or Ephraim wasn't listed is, uh, again, for, perhaps for idolatry. Again, I don't know uh, that that's really the case. One of the other thoughts on, on Dan uh, not being listed here uh, specifically is that uh, there's a possibility that Dan's uh, relatively small tribe and their numbers were just uh, joined together with uh, Naphtali's, and that would be Dan's um, brother by his mom, Bilhah. Uh, so, uh, again, I don't really have answers. I did want to talk about that because I know this is, you know, if you study this chapter, this is some of the stuff that's going to come up. Um, but what I think is important to note here is that I, I do believe that this is the literal tribes of Israel. And, and for those that think, well, it could be the spiritual tribe, but let's just talk about this for just a moment. Um, I, I think first that, you know, all throughout history, we see that, that God has always had a covenant relationship with Israel that's unlike any other relationship with the rest of his creation and even those of us that he loves and, and are, are, are blood-bought and redeemed Gentiles. There is a distinct blessing over Israel. Uh, I don't think God has forgotten that even after Jesus came and even after Paul came and was sent to the Gentiles. I, I think there is a special uh, blessing that's still over Israel, over the house of Israel. Uh, so I think that what we're seeing here, and the important thing to note is that God continues to watch over Israel even through this great uh, tribulation, even through the greatest season of distress that Israel will have ever been through, that God is still faithful to preserve and to watch over Israel and raise up a remnant uh, of, uh, of Israel who will preach the gospel throughout the world. Again, I could be wrong on my interpretation of it, but I believe that, that that's consistent with the Word of God, consistent with Scripture, uh, and I see no reason now to, to, to make this anything less than literal um, remnants of those 12 tribes. He's taking 12,000 from each tribe. Now, one other thing that I want to deal with, and you guys can, uh, can, can go and appreciate this now through uh, Ancestry.com and other sites like that, the reality is, uh, you know, these... The, these that were of each of those 12 tribes, it may very well include you and I. It, 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 I'm not convinced that it absolutely has to be, you know, 100% blood in that or, or if it's just a remnant. I mean, so it can be anybody. But again, I don't know that that's really that important. What's important to me is to see that God is still divinely favoring and blessing this covenant with Israel all throughout history and certainly here at the last day. So uh, let's come to our third question here. Who else did John see? And what were they doing, verse 9 and 10 here? Who else does John see? After he hears the number of them which were sealed, verse 9 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So who else does John see? People of all nations, here's what it says. A great multitude of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. What's he see? All these people in white robes with palms in their hand. People of all nations, and we're going to get to this in just a moment, but palms in their hands. Palm sounds very familiar to me. They're, they're standing before the throne of God is what they said. Uh, a great multitude, which nobody could number, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, salvation to our God. That doesn't mean salvation to our God like we think. It means salvation comes from our God alone. To me, this sounds very, very familiar with the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. When Christ comes riding in that, that first entry, 
is, is first coming. He comes and the triumphal entry, they crowd, Hosanna. God saves. God saves. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God saves. That's what they were crying out, or save now. God saves. Here's what we see in heaven. There's a multitude which no man can number, dressed in white, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white, with palms in their hands, just like on the triumphal entry, crying out, God saves. Salvation belongs to God. Salvation comes from God. It only comes from God. Now, these palms, again, are a symbol of joy, of triumph, of victory. Now, there's something else that we need to understand here, and, and I, I think there's some significance. Um, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. Again, I'm getting ahead, but I want to read this. I looked and... Lo, a lamb stood on the mountain Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he go. These were the redeemed from among men, being the first fruits, pay attention to this part, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb, being the first fruits. Now that's key because in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Speaking of the end, Zechariah says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Now, uh, what Zechariah is alluding to is that during this great tribulation, that 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 the Feast of Tabernacles may be renewed. Now, so let me talk about this a little bit. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles uh, was the, the, the Feast of Commemoration, a memorial, if you will, of how God brought His children out of bondage in Egypt and kept them through uh, this wilderness season. Through the wilderness season, God provided for them and kept them and God made sure that they had what they needed for those 40 years as they wandered through the wilderness. So that was like a tribulation period, if you will. But God watched over them. He protected them. He sheltered them. He told them after the fact that you'll, 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 you'll do this. You'll, rem you'll remember the Feast of Tabernacles as a memorial of how I watched over you through all of this. And, and I've told you before, all throughout Scripture we see types and shadows, patterns of what to expect at the coming of the Lord. All of what we see, even in the, in the flood in the beginning, from Adam being covered with, uh, with skins to the flood, all of these are type and shadow of Jesus Christ who would come, where salvation would be found in Him, where our sins would be covered and atoned by His blood, His death. All of these things are types and shadows we see even in, in the uh, uh, um, Plagues upon Egypt and God bringing his children out of bondage there. These are types and shadows of Jesus Christ coming. The blood on the doorpost, of course, that would be symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ. When the death angel sees it, he'd pass over, we'd live and not die. As God would bring them out through plagues of judgment, it would be those judgments that caused the, the releasing of God's people. It would be through those plagues that uh, Egypt would release them. Ultimately, they would come after them. And then we would see there that God would overthrow evil. God would wipe out his enemies there in the Red Sea and lead his people. And even through that season of tribulation, God would protect them as God was ultimately bringing them to the promised land. 
You and I are ultimately headed to a promised land, an eternal promised land. There will be tribulation to come. So, so why are you saying all that, Pastor Mark? Uh, the Bible talks about then from what Zacharias prophesying is that in the end days, during this great tribulation period, that, that people will once again turn and remember the Feast of Tabernacles. So it would make perfect sense again if God's raised up 144,000, particularly if they are of the tribe of Israel, if God sealed and separated 144,000 44,000 uh, Jews who, who are, are, are Messianic Jews, you know, and they're preaching Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, they, they are the ones, you know, in the great tribulation period preaching to all of the world, reminding them, listen, the same God that watched over us in the wilderness, he's watching over us now. And they will revive, if you will, that Feast of Tabernacles. Well, why is this important? Sakat. Uh, and I probably pronounced that wrong, but uh, it's still celebrated to this day. Why is that important? Well, the Feast of Tabernacles was not only a memorial of how God was faithful to, to protect and to cover and to provide for his people during that tribulation, that 40 years of wandering. It's also uh, um, a testimony celebrating the end of a successful harvest. So, so this... This same Feast of Tabernacles commemorates two things. It commemorates how faithful God is to protect us even during tribulation and trials. It also celebrates that, that God sees to it that there is a bountiful harvest. It's the end of that harvest feast. We're celebrating, look what God has done. It's like bringing all the crops into the storehouse at one time and seeing the barns being filled up and celebrating, saying, oh my gosh, praise the Lord. Look at what a wonderful harvest that God has brought. What a great and awesome and mighty thing that God has done celebrating the harvest and the God of the harvest. So why is this important? Now, what did John just see? He said, I saw a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people in tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, crying with a loud voice, saying that God saves. Look what an awesome thing that he's done. Now, let's come back to what I read for you in, in Revelation. We fast forward a little bit. He says, these are the first fruits, the first fruits. Yeah. These 144,000 are the first fruits. But then we see this great harvest, which no man can number. And now they're standing in heaven celebrating God. I believe this is what we are seeing. People of all nations crying out salvation. Salvation comes from God and God alone. Now this is pretty powerful. I'm going to try and get through this, this chapter tonight. It, it shouldn't take long uh, so let's move on to the next couple of verses here. Describe the scene and significance. Question number four for tonight of verse 11 and 12. So we just see uh, these in white robes crying and waving palm branches. God saves. God saves. And verse 11, 12 says, And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Well, what do we see here? So we see that the redeemed standing there. We see the redeemed, the, uh, the blood ball, those that have been saved through the great tribulation period, praising God, declaring that our salvation comes from God and God alone. He's the only reason. And at that moment, we hear, we hear the, the choir of heaven, the angels who are standing around. The Bible says they're standing there around the throne, around the elders, around the four beasts. All of a sudden, they fall on their face before the throne. And what's the first word they cry out? Amen. I know we say that word in church, but do you understand what it means? It means absolute truth. It means you're right. We confirm what was just said. We confirm the word of God. So when we amen the preacher, we're saying that's exactly right. They just said, no, these redeemed are crying out. Salvation belongs to God. Our Savior is God. Our salvation came through God alone. God provided. God covered us even through this great tribulation. And when they say that, the angels can't help but fall on their face and worship God. The angels, think about that. These aren't the redeemed. 
They're not blood bought. They, they are created. They've already been in heaven, but they fall down. They fall down at that, declaring it's absolute truth. Look how great our God is. And again, celebrating this wonderful harvest, saying amen, confirming what was just said, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, and power, and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Confirm it. It's truth. Brother and sister, that still applies to us. Not if the angels in heaven are going to declare that blessings belong to God. Listen, not, not, not just blessings come. All blessings belong to God. Think about that. All blessings belong to God. They're His. Whatever God's put in you, are just a steward, a caretaker. You are blessed so that you can be a blessing. All blessings belong to God. One day when we stand before the Lord, you'll realize how naked you really are. How empty you really are. How bare. You don't have anything to offer. When you pay your tithe, you're not, you're not giving God something that already belongs to him. That's why when you, when you withhold it, you're robbing God is what Malachi says. All the blessings, they already belong to God. All glory belongs to God. You don't have anything to glory in. All glory belongs to God. All wisdom. You think you're smart. What All your wisdom, it belongs to God. It comes from God. All thanksgiving, it belongs to God. All honor belongs to God. All power belongs to God. All might belongs to God. That's a faithful and true saying. The angels in heaven declare it. And they're just amen in the redeemed who now recognize that unlike never before. Question number five. So let's talk about who this great multitude is and why this is significant in verse 13 to 14. So now John's seen this great multitude. And then one of the elders answers, verse 13, is asking a question, saying to me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? Who are these in the white robes, and where do they come from? And John doesn't know the answer to that. He says to him, sir, you know. He said, I don't know. Only you know. He said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I want to look at something. He says there's 144,000 that he hears the name of. And if we fast forward a little bit in Revelation, we see that they are the first fruits. But let me ask you this. Are the 144,000 the only ones that John sees in heaven? This is a, a very important question. Because there are, there are some belief systems out there, and they are absolutely wrong, biblically wrong. I don't understand how they arrive at the conclusion. I've heard people try and suggest that there will only be 144,000 who are going to be saved. Only 144,000 are going to come and be in heaven. Brothers and sisters, there, there are some, some great errors in that logic. So very clearly, one of the things, this is why I think, who, who are this multitude? Well, we see very clearly there's a great multitude which no man can number. Now, just stay with me here. No man can number versus 144,000. Obviously, we can number 144,000 because God just gave him that number. And then turns around and says, and I saw, after this 144,000, I saw a great multitude which no man can number. Where is this great multitude? They're in heaven, praising God. Declaring that salvation comes from God. What are they wearing? White robes. The elder says these are the ones that came out of the great tribulation. It's certainly more than 144,000. They are of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. Every race, every tribe, every color, every part of earth, every denomination probably. Look at this now. This great multitude. He said, where did they come from and who are they? He said, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to deal with this 144,000 for just a moment and show you just some, some truth. So for those that might argue that this 144,000, well, let me come back to this let me, before I do this. Uh, this multitude's from every tribe and, and nation and all this. So again, 
Uh, if we come back to our idea earlier that this 144,000 that's sealed uh, is anything other than literally the the descendants of the 12 tribes, why would, why would that be necessary when it's clear that the great multitude is of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues? So God can certainly have 144,000 who, who are of the bloodline of these 12 tribes and then on top of that still have the multitude, which would include perhaps me and you or anybody else who's maybe not of that bloodline. There's still going to be room for us in heaven. But and let me come back to this 144,000. So for those that would argue that there's only going to be 144,000 uh, in, in heaven, um, now, now from what you're saying, then you, you've got to take that, if you're going to take that number literal like that, then you've got to take it literal that they are of these 12 tribes. So let me start with this, and that sounds wonderful, even because you, you, then you could argue, hey, my, uh, my DNS, DNA results show that I'm part of that lineage, so you might even include yourself in that 144,000, but if you do that, here's who you would exclude. So this would be one of the biggest problems. You would exclude Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If there's only going to be 144,000 in heaven and they must come from these 12 tribes, then you've excluded Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God didn't exclude them. Oh, Pastor, you didn't exclude them. Sure you did, right? Because Jacob, Jacob's name would become Israel. The 12 tribes would be his son. So you, you, can't, have, you can't have a descendant who came before. There was no Israel when there was Abraham and Isaac. So the first problem you would have with that is that you, you've excluded Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and, and God, God didn't. I want to look at something in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. And, and Jesus talking about uh, um, Gentiles here. In Matthew 8, he says, Many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, where? In the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's interesting. Because now listen, if we only have 144,000 and they come from this, again, I'm, I'm trying to give you some information to combat anybody who would try and tell you there's only 144,000, only 144,000 even coming out of the Great Tribulation. It's not so. It doesn't biblically hold any water. You, you do too, too many excluded, exclusive things if you do that. Um, in Matthew 8, 11, he clearly states Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in the kingdom of heaven. So we know there must be more than just this 144 that's been sealed off here who end up in heaven because these come from those 12 tribes. We also know that in Matthew 8, verse 11, Jesus is referring to Gentiles. And the problem would be that if you exclude this 144,000 to just that literal interpretation coming from that, then all Gentiles would be excluded. And, and we know very clearly that Jesus was alluding to Gentiles coming from, you know, uh, everywhere, the northeast, the south, and, and they will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Here's the other issue with that. Now, if you're going to take it uh, in that literal form, I already read to you earlier in uh, uh, um, Revelation um, 14, where it says that these 144 are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Okay, so stay with this train of thought. If this 144,000 is are the exclusive ones that are going to be in heaven, then we've excluded it to being 144,000 men and men only, no women. They said they were not defiled women, and you know that God's not talking about any sort of same-sex stuff. He says, these are they which were not de defiled with women, for they are virgins. So then this would mean that the 144,000, if, if just for all this train of thought, so any that would argue that there's only going to be 144,000 in heaven or only 144,000 that are going to be saved through the great tribulation period, then, then all of a sudden we eliminate Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We eliminate anyone who is a Gentile. None of these are biblical, by the way, ideas. Of course, I just read to you what Jesus said about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, specifically by name, being in the kingdom of God. We would also then have to 
say that that 140, if there's only 144,000, then these are only men. And these are only unmarried men. Now we've really got a big problem, right? Uh, so now we definitely exclude Abraham. We exclude Moses. We exclude Peter because he, he was married. So uh, we exclude some of the other disciples. We also exclude Hannah and Mary and Dorcas and, and, and these, these great women of faith. Wow. Wow. So if, if those are the only ones in heaven, listen to me, uh, I, I'm telling you because there, there are belief systems out there. They are not Christian. They are belief systems out there. They may claim to be Christian, but they are belief systems out there which tell you that there's only 144,000 that are going to go to heaven. Don't you want to be one of those 144,000? Well, sure. Who doesn't want to be one of the ones going to heaven? Well, the problem is if you're going to reduce it down to 144,000, you got to figure out where you're coming up with that number. If you're going to say you're getting it from this Bible, then all of a sudden you, you've excluded people that Jesus said were included. And, and listen, I, I, I've been in ministry long enough. I've had women try and talk to me about the 144,000, not even realizing, listen, if you're worried about the 144,000, don't you realize you've excluded yourself if you're using the Bible as your basis? So who is this 144,000? It's a multitude from, from every tribe, every nation, right? Here's the awesome thing about this. It says, these are those who have washed their robes. They've washed their robes in what? In the blood of the Lamb. This is awesome. They've washed themselves. How do we wash ourselves? We the Bible says this in, in, in Romans. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we'll be saved. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They've washed themselves not in their own blood. These are martyrs. These that are standing there in this, this great multitude. We, we can go to Revelation 20 and, and we get a snapshot that these these. This multitude that's coming out of the great tribulation, they're going to die for their faith. It's going to be hell on earth. It's going to be difficult. You don't want to go through that. But there will be a multitude which can't be numbered that's going to be saved even through this horrible thing. That's why you know, a lot of people think, well, why would such a loving God bring about this great tribulation? Because it's not God's desire that even one would perish. It's a final act of grace. You, you think this is hell? You haven't seen hell yet. You think this mess that we're living in is hell and chaos? You haven't seen hell and chaos yet. You think the great tribulation sounds horrible? You haven't seen horrible until you see hell. And the reality of hell, the eternity spent in hell. So it's a very gracious thing that God would allow there to be a season of hell on earth. Because this, this season of hell on earth, this great tribulation doesn't even touch the tip of the iceberg in comparison to what hell will really be like for all eternity for those that know not God. These are they that have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. What makes them righteous isn't their own blood that's covering this. It's not what they did or how they died for Christ. It's not because they preached the gospel or did anything. They've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, they said, God is my everything. I surrender my life to Him and to this cause. These are the ones that are singing and praising Him in heaven. And our last question here tonight, this will be quick. Describe the scene and significance here in the last two verses of chapter 7. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Therefore, as someone, some scholar long ago said, Therefore, find out what it's there for. In this sense, it says, These are they who came out of the great tribulation 
and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, therefore they are before the throne. You want to know why I'm in heaven? It's because of the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, I'm where I'm at today, because of the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, I stand before his throne, and I worship him, serving him night and day in his temple. Because without the blood of the Lamb, I would not be in heaven. Without the blood of the Lamb, I could not have made it. Without what he's done, without his sacrifice, without his death, I would not be. And for this reason, they worship in night and day. Now, pay attention here, brother and sister. If all of heaven, look, it says night and day they do this. They, uh, they worship him in the temple. They serve him. Glory, hallelujah. If this is what eternity is going to look like, don't you think we ought to start practicing now? For this reason, they serve him. For this reason, they worship him night and day. If you and I could understand that today, it would make it a whole lot easier for us to serve him now. Every day, every day of our life now, he's worthy. Because of his death, we can live eternally. Because of his death, I'm going to go to heaven one day. Because of that, I want to go ahead and serve him now. The reason I serve him now is because of what he's done. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. For the lamb that's in the midst, listen, it says, they, they'll hunger no more, neither thirst no more. They're not going to be in the heat of the sun any longer. Why? Because the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne will feed them, lead them to living fountains. Listen, I want you to see God not only does that in heaven, but he does that for you and I now. Those of us that make heaven our hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior now, we won't just live like that then, we'll live like that now. And we'll realize that the only reason that I'm going to be in heaven is because of the blood of the Lamb, and I've washed my robe in that blood. I'm covered in it. It covers me. Listen, how can you be covered in something and hidden at the same time? When you're covered in it, everybody sees. Because I've been saved, blood-bought as we called it, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the whole world should see my love for him, my service to him, my worship unto him. Not only then, but now. I'm not worried about tomorrow. I'm not worried about all of these things because that one in the middle of the throne feeds me, leads me to fountains of living waters. He wipes away the tears from my eyes. That's not just an eternal promise. It's a promise even for the now. He feeds the birds of the year. He provides water for them. He comforts them when they mourn. He provides for them anew, afresh each day. The same God that you and I serve. I'm going to close with this quote. I'm not sure who it was that originally stated it, so forgive me for that. But it said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How about you? How about you? Are you actively, actively living for Jesus Christ? We're reading the book of Revelation, talking about the end times. And brother and sister, again, you, you, you have to be willfully blind, choosing to ignore the obvious signs. Just like in the day of Noah, there are so many signs coming down from heaven and upon the earth right now, declaring where we are. In the scheme of God's timetable here and his soon coming, I believe we are indeed in the last days and you and I need to be ready. What does ready mean? It means having washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. And listen, if they are washed in the blood, you can't wash a robe in blood and walk around and not have people notice. For those of you that say that you are saved and yet those around you don't know it or you have to tell them in order for them to know it, I question whether or not you really washed your robe in the blood of the Lamb. If He's the reason that you know that you live today, then you ought to live for Him today. 
with every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, for your church. Again, that you would search us and know us. God, open our eyes to discern the times that we're living in, to recognize the season, Lord. Lord, as you search and know our hearts, God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to clearly see and acknowledge, confessing today, Lord, whether or not we have truly washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. Is my life covered? Is my life covered in the blood? If I'm covered in the blood, then may the whole world see it. May I proudly declare it, unashamedly walk in it, live in it, serve you with every breath that I have, and every fiber of my being, and worship you with all that I am. I pray tonight for this church, Lord, that we would walk as those who are blood bought May we be the ones declaring the blessed hope that we have through Jesus Christ so that others can see because we are the light in darkness, Lord. I pray tonight, Lord, that this word would take root in our hearts, God, and I thank you and praise you for this day. May you bless these, your people, tonight as we leave. May we leave in the peace and the power and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ladies and the church of God, I love you. What are you doing with the word of God? I pray that you're applying it to your life and walking in it daily. I love you, and I hope to see you this Sunday, 9 o'clock in the house, 1030 in the parking lot. Have a blessed evening.